this seminar, we have no one sleep as our speaker today. I wanted to just introduce our own son, Summer uh, Norman, has been a major contributor to the de development of our understanding of geophysics on mid ocean ridges, continental margins, subduction zones, and island arcs, magmatism, the thermal evolution of the mantle, and mantle plumes, Archean tectonites, as well as fault mechanisms. He's also worked on the tectonics of Mars and Jupiter satellite Europe. Yes. So yeah. you have that's that fair. And now he's gonna talk about the it doesn't say origin of life in this title, but it says dawn of life. Yeah, dawn of life, right. And the uh, and so uh, yeah. yeah, you have a wide yeah. spectrum. Normally is from Stanford University and, and has a past from yeah. Wisconsin, no. Uh, Michigan. Michigan. Okay, please. And I have a bit of a rural Michigan, southwestern Michigan accent. Uh, so if I pronounce something that's hard uh, to, uh, for Europeans or even Englishmen uh, to understand, uh, 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 please just yell and stop me. Okay, we're going to uh, combine. Uh, 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 some things here. I'm going to uh, be dealing uh, with serpentine. Uh, this is a white smoker vent where uh, water of various temperatures can come out of uh, serpentine uh, near the mid ocean ridge. I'm uh, going to be examining a particular hypothesis for the origin of life, one uh, that's been proposed by molecular biologists but ones where they've given me enough uh, detail uh, that the geologist has uh, something to do. And then I'm going to talk about actually uh, looking uh, for the evidence of life. And I'm going to finally conclude uh, that we have an untapped uh, paleontological uh, reservoir on the Earth, uh, the model, and uh, given the very abysmal record in the Adean, uh, the mantle of the Earth uh, may very well uh, be the uh, record of last resort. Can I find so the arrows? I think I push, <laughs> just push that. Or, okay, that works. Okay, yes. Okay, I'm going to uh, give a quick uh, uh, quick tour of something uh, that lasted uh, longer than the planet is going. Uh, the present Earth-Moon system starts when a Mars-sized object collides with a Venus-sized object. Uh, we end up with the Earth and the Moon as an aftermath. I'm going to talk about prebiotic conditions, life originates, and then by the time we get a geological record, uh, we have no oxygen in the air. Uh, we have less sulfate in the ocean. We're down to a modest amount of PCO2, pH of the ocean about the same as now. Uh, the Earth teems with life, as we will see by the time we get a decent record, uh, uh, which is nice for one thing, uh, but it's bad if we want to see what came before. So I'm uh, going to continue onward here, and I'm going to uh, deal uh, with a hypothesis uh, for the RNA world or origin. I'm going to focus mainly on the Earth, uh, but uh, I'm going to uh, mention Mars in the large asteroid series. Uh, we have the moon forming impact, uh, difficult to date precisely, uh, but in round numbers, uh, the Earth is vaporized, completely uninhabitable. Uh, the Earth condenses, will become habitable at some state, and we start to see a geological record, and we're again dealing with a length of time that's longer than the planet or so. Uh, the record is extremely meager during this time, but not non-existent, so I'm going to have to combine theory. Uh, concentrate on the Earth because I'm standing on it, uh, Mars is open to life early. It's really chemically a lot uh, like the Earth. If we're worried about rocks and water and stuff reacting, there's water. Uh, the record exists there. Uh, it's basalt dominated uh, like the oceans of the Earth. 
uh, there is uh, some andesite. Uh, Ceres is serpentine dominated, so basalt is going to be rare. The inside, deep inside of the planet is still climate and habitable as long as they're circulating. Uh, fluids, the record exists, and the name here uh, does mean uh, C, which may turn out to be pressure. Okay. Uh, Colors from rocks uh, uh, from Ishua, uh, Greenland, uh, call them a black shale. They've been metamorphosed. Uh, they're a silica-rich uh, shale, like you would extract natural gas uh, uh, from. Now, this is a sampling bias. Only the very uh, silica-rich shales don't turn into big garnets when they're metamorphosed, and the bedding uh, in the rock ends up being uh, reasonably well preserved. It's a black shale, uh, turbidites, it's got pyrite in it, iron formation exists, uh, coeval, which would be caused by iron based photosynthesis. Iron is fractionated from magnesium, uh, uh, so there's an iron uh, cycle by this time. Uh, pyrite, uh, sulfur based uh, photosynthesis, sulfide to sulfate, producing organic matter. Uh, the organism dies, and other organisms on the bottom will take uh, uh, ferric iron and sulfate out of the water and have a feast. Evidence from the iron uh, formation from rare earth uh, systematics that the pH of the ocean was at its modern value. Uh, iron, as we'll see later, ferrous iron is insoluble under these conditions in the ocean, so to get an open water iron formation, uh, we have to have near modern levels of CO2. Uh, we have land weathering to produce the shale. Uh, marine deposition just off the modern uh, margin now. We understand the modern margin. We can understand this. Uh, but we already have life doing a lot now. Uh, so we have to figure out what goes on before life. But again, just modern shale. Uh, gas shale and the sampling bias here, uh, that aluminum rich shale, uh, which aluminum rich, or aluminium rich clays, I should say here, uh, uh, ends up uh, being turned to garnet, and that's uh, the end of it. Okay, photosynthesis, land and ocean, earth teams with life. Uh, we have. Uh, Microbial maps uh, covering every full cycles. Uh, ocean has reached a climate temperature quartz. Uh, weather's mechanically rather than solution. Uh, uh, CO2 at a limit that if we had it now in the room would not even give us a headache. Uh, no oxygen. Uh, the Earth has already been strongly affected by light. Uh, difference here is we probably have two bars of nitrogen in the air. This will have subtle and hard to detect effects. And once we get light, we get ammonia produced that's subducted. Uh, this is a stable biological uh, buffer. If it's too cold, the volcano is venting nitrogen wind. If it becomes warm, uh, the, uh, we get light. And if we get too much light, it sucks too much ammonia down, starts to get cold. This is a stable buffer, just like the CO2 buffer. The crust has already started to become oxidized. Once we get photosynthesis, methane is produced. Hydrogen escapes to space. The hydrogen ultimately comes from water. And we've lost tens of meters of water uh, to oxidize, from the oceans to oxidize the crust maybe a couple hundred, but not a lot compared to depleting the ocean or not to affect the oxidation state of the matter. Okay, where to study paleontology, the uh, vent of an arc volcano, and also, now, even though this looks like very mantle derived, you wouldn't think you have to take the biological <laughs> cloth but you do. Uh, the carbon dioxide coming back uh, is partly uh, from 
carbonate, partly from organic carbon, partly from biological carbonate that's washed into the trench from the surface. This can be seen from studying C13 and also helium isotopes to correct for the amount of carbon that comes from the metal. We have SO2 coming out. Much of this is seductive sulfate, ultimately a product of photosynthesis. And even though it's cold today and there was less sulfur brimstone, if you want to please the Texas School Board Commission, coming out of the arc volcano. The arc volcano was different, not hugely different, probably a factor of two less sulfur than coming out of a modern volcano. But still something where there is a difference that's biological control in what we would think would be a hard rock. Okay, go to the moon forming impact. Very unpleasant. Life on the pre-existing bodies was probably wiped out. A few hunks of rock may have been ejected ballistically and colonized another object. But the Earth stays uninhabitable for at least 10 million years. The rock vapor condenses. We end up with a hot, internally molten rock at the surface. The metal freezes from the middle both ways outward. The lunar orbit is controlled by how rapidly heat can escape from the top of the atmosphere. This can be still seen by astronomers in the particular orbit we have of the moon. As I go over, here we have the crescent moon, and it's the right part of the sky that you can see the moon due north as we went over Iceland. The moon does get north and south of the ecliptic, so you can be in Iceland south of the Arctic Circle and still see the moon in the north where you can't see the sun. The Earth first fluid to condense is basically platinum ore, sodium chloride fluid around 1,000 degrees K. And like you would find in the Skerdard, very sodium chloride rich. No evidence of that has ever been found. We start to cool to a long-lasting stable state. We have most of the Earth's budget, which have rounded to 100 bars of CO2 in the air. It's about 500 K or 200 degrees C, depending on how you want to think about it. And this stable lasts until the Earth can sequester this CO2 into its interior, which since the inside of the Earth is hot and silicate, and carbonates are unstable in the presence of silicate at high temperatures, may take a while. We have a greenhouse geotherm here. Common silicates and siderite, magnesite, dolomite, a couple different reactions here involving calcite. The greenhouse here has enough partial pressure of CO2 that all these carbonates are stable at the surface. Sodium carbonates and bicarbonates, however, are unstable, and so the Earth never had a sodium carbonate or bicarbonate ocean. These, of course, could occur locally and be perfectly good bionic venues. The initial carbonatized ocean crust has a couple of problems. It will only hold a finite amount of CO2. The metal is hot, so the subducted material will immediately remelt, and the CO2 will be vented to the surface. When does this process start to stick? And again, we have meager information. Upad Yang, if I'm not pronouncing his name right at all, found evidence of subducted material in India. Logical sequence of events is the ridge and subduction age, which are not distinguished, is about 2.2, 2.3. This is from the Uranium Isotope Systematics. The material is placed in the lithosphere 
the base of the Latin spirit was remelded again, and this has ended up uh, in an indigenous complex at this time. So we have some evidence that seduction was sticking at this time, uh, but not a lot at the present time. Uh, and this you know, gives us a potential time for the seduction to occur. Okay. Uh, the trick here is the ocean crust can only hold, this seems like a lot of CO2 if you're worried about global warming now, if we uh, get the carbon we're bending to go in the ocean crust, we have no problems, it's just the CO2 of the air is in the air, and the ocean crust is at the bottom of the ocean, and hydrothermal circulation isn't instantaneously fast. So we have to have a lot, a fair bit of CO2, but we have to subduct the whole ocean crust at least 10 times. And uh, the ocean uh, 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 crust uh, uh, remelts, and uh, CO2 comes back on arcs. And uh, the time here to do us is if we have the ocean crust being recycled every a uh, million years, heat flow like 10 times uh, present. Uh, we could do everything in, in 10 million years if we didn't have any reflux back. Uh, the, uh, uh, if we're dealing with heat flow about three times, now it'll take at least 100 million years. So it takes a long time here to get the Earth uh, cool enough that something, uh, even a thermophile organism, uh, could exist on it. And here, because I'm interested in habitability, it turns out that this tail of the process, uh, the Earth around uh, uh, 25 uh, uh, bars of CO2 starts to become uh, climate. Uh, again, in, in round uh, it gets, it gets below 100 degrees C, but it's going to hear and read it off here, it's 25 bars. Uh, we can have a thermophile environment there, it's going to stay in that time, so the hypothesis that life evolved in a thermophile setting is at least viable. We get down to a climate uh, setting, which is where the biologists have put the light. The entire ocean crust gets turned, the, it, exposed part of it gets turned to uh, calcium and magnesium carbonates. Uh, we have, we're down here on the final uh, tail of the curve. It's perfectly carbon. The ocean uh, is buffered by carbonates rather than by basalt. And we're dealing with subduction of CO2. We're dealing with an interior abiotic uh, process. So there's no the uh, reason that the demise of CO2 is going to spend a lot of time in, in this particular area. We've subducted almost all the CO2, so the amount of CO2 coming out of the Earth is independent of, of, of what's uh, pittance that's left on the surface. So uh, we may stay in this uh, region here on the curve uh, for millions or maybe tens of millions of years at the rate of point of time is slow at the, that time, but there's no reason to expect uh, that this process would last much of the day, and, uh, since we're uh, dealing with the rapid uh, decrease in something that's controlled by internal rather than external processes in the Earth. We will switch from this process to the normal weathering uh, and flux of CO2 into the ocean crust that depend on the amount of CO2. Uh, during this process, the ocean crust is becoming completely carbonatized, so the amount of CO2 that goes down in subduction is independent of the amount in the air. Okay, we need to get that. So. And this doesn't, I'm pushing the wrong button here. Okay, we have a mild greenhouse at the time, and their biologists, William Martin's group in Germany, Russell's group, group in uh, the United Kingdom, uh, uh, a couple recent uh, papers here, 
And uh, uh, the things on this side are something a geologist can do something about. Uh, the things on this side are uh, what the uh, biologists have said that it's had. We have a round of our CO2. Uh, it's climate. We have millions of years, which is a long time for a microorganism, but maybe long or short, depending on how you think about evolution. Uh, the ocean is pH 6. Uh, key points here is that uh, ferrous iron and sulfate, uh, which are built necessary things for life as we see it, uh, the uh, light uh, where it's going to start at the white smoker vents above serpentine. Uh, they're going to vent about pH 11 water, and they're going to uh, 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 vent uh, molecular hydrogen. Okay, the idea here is the light begins in very fine pores in the chimney. Pores uh, basically like in uh, travertine. It's initially going to use the gradient between pH 11 and pH 6 uh, as it uh, uh, becomes light. Uh, uh, the pores are going to act as the cells. The lipids that make cell membranes are going to line uh, the pores of the cell, uh, act as uh, uh, diffusion barriers where the, arc, the nascent life in, organism, in an organism can take. We go all the way from RNA world to the last common ancestor uh, without light exiting this mode of life. Uh, life evolves the ability to use uh, H2 and CO to be methanogens, acetogens, uh, to make organic matter directly. Uh, the use of carbon monoxide not sorted out. It, ha it probably occurs almost immediately after this. And maybe the, the machinery here is such that if any carbon monoxide is around, which is a very valuable energy source, even though not good to us, uh, we insist on washing a car with a motor on in the garage. Uh, very good food for microbes, very high energy uh, substrate compared to this one. Uh, the uh, methane that's produced goes up in the atmosphere, gets hit by ultraviolet light, makes some carbon monoxide, uh, which there's no sink for in the atmosphere, not particularly soluble in water, so about as soluble as nitrogen, nitrogen or oxygen, so most of it stays in the air rather than the ocean. Or once it builds up, an organism that can use it will be very prosperous. And the machinery for this and this are not a lot different. They may be this, even the same. So this is something the biologist has to short out. Cell means membranes evolve independently. We get bacteria in archaea, the two great branches of life. This one later uh, becomes uh, archaea and separate uh, is now defined in the end carryouts, which are us uh, standing here in the room. Okay, the white smoker vent here we have. Uh, uh, the pH gradient is the natural energy force. And what does a geologist can do here? Checks the chemistry, checks the physics, and can check uh, the rock record. We're not, I'm not going to uh, uh, try to uh, second guess uh, detailed uh, molecular biochemistry. Uh, the greenhouse again here. Uh, Key uh, positive points, uh, serpentine, uh, the free energy here is uh, 5 log 10 RT. And, and there's kind of the point in here, the biologists uh, uh, make that if you're, uh, let's say, trying to do water uh, uh, power early in Sweden, you wouldn't try to harness the biggest waterfall in Sweden, would you? You would try to harness a small stream or something. Uh, and uh, present light really doesn't use ultraviolet light. It doesn't use gamma rays. It just it can't harness extreme energy sources. And it may have been easier uh, uh, for the molecular consortium uh, that becomes light 
uh, to be able to handle this relatively weak energy source uh, from a pH gradient. Uh, we also have ribose, which is relatively easy uh, to make in an alkaline environment. Boron stabilizes it. There seems to be plenty of this from relatively limited uh, uh, studies in, in ancient serpentines like Ishua. Uh, serpentine has uh, iron nickel metal, it will have osmeridium, it will have chromite, magnetite, glorite. Uh, so if you want a particular uh, metal catalyst uh, for some stage of the biology, uh, and uh, the uh, boron stabilization has been re uh, studied there. So we have something that we can make at least one. Uh, ribose is the building block for, uh, for RNA and, D and then DNA. Uh, so it will form spontaneously and stay stable in these environments. Uh, something's going backwards rather than forwards. Sorry. Okay. A little bit now of geochemistry of the entire ocean. We have stability fields of hematite, magnetite, uh, uh, analyte, which is uh, a proxy uh, uh, for iron rich silicates. Uh, we have iron carbonate out here. Uh, we have an invariant point uh, and a, a methanogen. If it finds an environment uh, with high CO2, and I'm using uh, hydrogen here rather than oxygen fugacity as my redox indicator. Uh, oxygen fugacities are extremely low under these conditions, and they only have mathematical significance. So, and any oxygen that you would find would be dynamically maintained, and uh, almost none of it. Uh, too little for a substrate of uh, light. And, uh, and so hydrogen dealing here with a real species. Uh, and you can see light here or, or where the methanogens operate. Methanogens can work both ways. If they uh, uh, find a hydrogen and CO2 uh, uh, depleted, in, strongly depleted environment, uh, they can take uh, methane and make uh, CO2 and hydrogen. They can take organic matter uh, that's reduced. Uh, just ordinary uh, uh, basalt is on this side of the line. It's somewhat reducing. Hot basalt would be up here. Uh, a serpentine could go up off the, the chart here. And uh, a prebiotic uh, vent here over early. Or if we have around one bar of CO2, lots of hot, so you're probably going up off uh, the map. And uh, uh, this is calibrated. And uh, you can see uh, that light, you've, we've used, that we've oxid, CO2 plus H2O would be fully oxidized. So we're a third of the way uh, to having the organic matter uh, fully oxidized. People are probably used to seeing this multiplied uh, by uh, six. Acetogen is an organism that goes directly to making organic matter uh, rather uh, than making methane and then using the ATP uh, to make organic matter. Okay, a little bit more uh, geochemistry with the ocean uh, crust is possible to. Uh, the ocean crust is a pH buffer, uh, high temperature circulation uh, ends up bending acid, uh, low temperature circulation is basic. Uh, the ocean has the modern buffer by the time uh, we get the first iron formation. Uh, the ocean crust uh, will keep uh, something reduced. Uh, it's a CO2 sink. Uh, Prehabitability, uh, but the solid main was meant CO2, and there'll be in this early time where we're still using up the additional C CO2 of the earth. Uh, the ocean crust is basically a sink uh, uh, taking CO2 uh, back into the interior of the earth. 
And uh, we can see by the time we have record, we moved uh, from pH 8 uh, to pH 7. Uh, the, uh, oops, I keep hitting the wrong one and going backwards. And uh, the uh, point here is the ocean crust is reducing, uh, and but the FeO is in solid solutions. It can be in silicates or hydroxides, and uh, the exact elements where it goes may stabilize uh, ferric or ferric iron. Only magnetite is relatively stoichiometric. So. Uh, we have serpentine, we have brucite if we're in low SiO2 uh, conditions. So at the poor environments, if we have low CO2 carbonates uh, uh, that would use up the brucite, uh, first can't form. So uh, silica and CO2, which are not directly acting as oxidation agents, act. Uh, controlling the oxidation state. Uh, the other point here that's a subtlety is that hydrogen gas can move in bottles uh, at relatively low pressures, uh, 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 probably in the hotter vents on the seafloor all the way down to the seafloor. On land vents, they're full of hydrogen bubbles, and uh, the gas can move uh, from high pH water to low pH water. Uh, the gas also becomes reducing as it cools. The concentration of gas, hydrogen gas in water in equilibrium uh, with serpentine is much greater at 100 degrees C than it is at 0 degrees C. Um, if you uh, uh, go from like 300 degrees C down to cold temperatures, you can get extremely reducing a, you, a hydrogen saturated water saturated hydrogen gas is the strongest reductant. It can make aluminium metal extremely rare, but uh, naturally, I uh, just said life is fairly oxidized to begin with. A biochemist wants uh, extremely reducing environments. These are available uh, whenever you have serpentine, especially if you can have gas that moves around. Okay, the hypothesis involves a white smoker vent. Uh, uh, we have the methanogen reaction here. The CO2 comes from the ocean, and having the high PCO2, a bar of it, uh, makes sure there's lots of it in the ocean at the time, uh, and having the low pH helps. Uh, the vent uh, is very alkaline. Uh, we have some hints if we ask extent organisms. Uh, nickel and cobalt, vitamin D12 in our bodies. Uh, this use roots very deeply. Anything living in this environment <coughs> uh, would find a large amount of these, as well as things that are more common, uh, like magnesium, that are very heavily used. But it's just not where I think it is. I'll eventually learn. Okay. <laughs> You're probably thinking now uh, what I thought when I first uh, saw the hypothesis. You have these chimneys. Uh, they don't last very long. If we start life in them, it's a dead end. But it turns out uh, that the uh, chimneys themselves basically have their own built-in uh, dispersal mechanism. Uh, chimneys topple, you get uh, fine dust, uh, and again, we're dealing with very small pores uh, that, that can get suspended in the water. Even pebble-sized fragments here, as in the diagram here, there are basalt cells. I'm using 4 a.m. sand here as a proxy uh, 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 for the travertine-like material uh, in the chimneys, it's going to behave this. There also will be the, the dust-sized particles that stay. As obvious ripple marks here, materials being uh, moved, and uh, that's will last a reasonable amount of time. Okay, uh, where uh, when we get serpentine, 
Uh, we have uh, places here uh, where tectonics ex exposes uh, the, the mantle of the Earth. Early Earth will have asteroid uh, impacts. Uh, we also uh, get cumulate olivine, both from basalt, a lot more from commadiites in the early Earth. Uh, so we're really appealing to an environment uh, that you claim exists, uh, most geologists are not going to do it. Okay, uh, we're looking at a land here. We don't know for sure how much land plays a role. I think most people uh, tend to think of marine uh, 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 beds. Uh, we have a land bed here. What looks like ice in the picture is uh, calcium uh, carbonate. And that forms when the CO2 in the air reacts uh, with calcium hydroxide in the water. We have travertine uh, deposits here. Every winter, this locality floods, and we get a new crop of travertine every year. Uh, this is a, a coin that's about the size of, uh, of your uh, uh, five coin uh, uh, for scale and. Uh, this in, uh, environment does exist on land and as soon as there is dry land. Okay, we still need to ch try to check the geological record uh, where we find the oldest rocks in the world, like in Greenland. Uh, we always uh, find serpentine. Uh, there's no serpentine in the granites that are costa. There are ultramavics, but they're considerably younger. Serpentine, uh, the mantle itself has chromite in this leaves some tracks, and that we get uh, chromite, uh, chrome-rich uh, mica uh, forming uh, in sediments, and uh, we get a, a record that serpentine was in fact exposed to weathering on land. We really don't have any good places to look. Uh, zircon cannot form in uh, uh, serpentine, in fact, they use uh, chrome-rich mica as a tool to tell uh, whether the inside of a the mica inside a zircon has uh, later been contaminated, which would preclude finding any real signal. We don't have any obvious uh, evidence of statistic serpentine in granite. Small amount of serpentine if it gets in assimilated into granite uh, will not uh, leave any particularly obvious uh, trace that it was in there. Uh, uh, clearly, uh, chromite and stuff will not persist within a granite. Okay, how uh, do we uh, try to find out a, a little bit more? Uh, we can check out the mantle of the Earth. We kind of uh, come up not particularly uh, good on uh, finding evidence in the crust. Uh, this is the uh, Paleo Moho here. This actually, it's actually in this locality a, a duplex of people who are in the front rows. Uh, we have a mantle of the earth here exposed uh, in Newfoundland, probably about Exposure date more recent, but probably ridge age around five or six hundred uh, million uh, years. Uh, we can check the mantle, and we can all itself where it happens to be exposed. Uh, we can also uh, check anything that comes out of the mantle, including one of the obvious things, diamonds. Okay, uh, the key to the process is a material that goes into the mantle, appears to keep its identity. We'll have sediments at the top. We get this layer of slab uh, carbonate uh, that forms on the bottom of warm hydrothermal circulation just off the ridge axis. Uh, we have a very CO2 thin domain that goes down once uh, the carbonization of the ocean crust has become limited by the amount of CO2. The water is lost at the arc. A little CO2 is lost, 
where we have very CO2-rich domains where you can look for isotopic features, and we have subducted sediments which will retain isotopic features. Both of these will also retain trace element features. If we're doing the younger part of the Earth where we have life anyway, we can do quite well. If we just simply go out to a mid-ocean ridge axis, we look and get a glassy basalt, we can see the evidence of life. The argon that goes into the metal correlates with argon-40 with potassium, so it's subducted ammonium, which behaves very much like potassium. We actually had a potassium volcano on the Stanford campus in California. It gets subducted. The sign of the isotope fractionation is different when we don't have oxygen in the air than we do. Diamonds are found with both fractionations, which causes lots of confusion. And there's probably over a bar of CO2 in the metal, maybe a half a bar in the crust. You don't think of a granite or a gneiss around here having ammonium in it, but many of them you would go out, if you analyze it carefully, take account that there's nitrogen in the air, which is going to be a major contaminant, which is why a few people measure it. Nitrogen-rich granites are common. And again, we have the slab-free window at Stanford, where magma hit freshly subducted sediments underneath where Stanford is in the Pacific subduction zone. The area is the type locality of ammonium feldspar buddingtonite. Unfortunately, it's out of bounds now and totally inaccessible. But just a kind of local example from Stanford of the occurrence of ammonium in rocks. It's a common and stable to matter temperatures that are ammonium silicates that are stable throughout the matter. Okay, diamond controversial. Many metal petrologists are unwilling to accept any information. Cartini is one of that group, but he's compiled here. And if we look at carbon that has gone down in the metal, which is the lowest one here, look at metamorphic diamonds, which are known to be from sediments. The distribution of diamonds follows the same range. Echogenic diamonds that are associated pretty obviously with subducted oceanic crust cover most of the range, but we get really the same range. There's clearly some isotopic fractionation in the metal. If you try to use the mid-ocean ridge axis, so much of this material is mixed together, you have to deal with about a part per mil of fractionation, which the isotopic fractionation in the magnetic gas wipes out any information. But peridotite diamonds are closer to the metal average. Diamonds in echogite end up having the range of what we get suspected. A complication in here is that something melts and then freezes in the metal. It can move from an echogenic vein to a peridotite domain. It may carry some of its signature with it. We have nitrogen isotopes. We have carbon isotopes. What goes down is what comes back. It's kind of the least astonishment hypothesis to me. There are many metal petrologists that will only accept mass-independent sulfur as an evidence of subduction and don't accept the other isotopes. It would seem that the racks that we expect to have, what's subducted in do just makes common sense. Not solid proof, but at least astonishment argument of what goes down and what comes back. Okay. 
do some paleontology here of not uh, doing it on the road. Uh, manganese nodules can only form in the ocean when the ocean is oxic. Uh, the oxic fluid is circulating and holds circulation well off the ridge axis uh, uh, and up reaching thallium and manganese out. The rock that participates in the manganese nodules. Thallium is a very heavy element. This is the only process uh, that fractionates its isotopes. And uh, we've only had oxic ocean for the last 1.5 uh, billion years. Uh, so uh, we also get uh, somewhat of an indication of the cycle of Hawaii is uh, where this has been found. Uh, the thallium isotopes uh, uh, correlate with manganese and other elements. Uh, dealing with rare minerals here, metal silicon carbide, metal tungsten carbide, metal uh, metallic silica. These are nice because they have carbon. We can see the light carbon-13 in. Uh, the reducing power to make these very rare materials uh, uh, found in chromite uh, ultimately comes from photosynthesis. Uh, lead isotopes, oxygen, uh, uh, maybe uh, even uh, uh, Anoxygenic photosynthesis uh, uh, separates thorium from lead. The material gets subducted, and we can see uh, the amount of thorium and lead source in, let's say, a mid ocean ridge valve up in lead isotopes. Uh, in an oxic environment, uh, uh, cerium behaves differently. Uh, we have biosignatures here that are extremely durable. Uh, that would survive perfectly well if we're worried about life ever being on uh, Venus. So uh, the mantle of the Earth here is extremely robust. We can't get a genus species of what went down, but we can detect the presence of something doing photosynthesis. Uh, here with the, mat, uh, with the thallium, we can actually see that there was free oxygen in the deep ocean at the time of the subduction. Okay. I told you that life has done a lot here. If we're interested in prebiotic environments, uh, we have to check them out to see whether we're dealing really with an environment uh, that's there. If we wanted uh, uh, to do, uh, investigate what uh, uh, Stone Age people could do in Sweden, we wouldn't go down to a, a, a pub in Stockholm and use this as the condition that they could make money selling beer in a pub and that would be their life. But that's obvious. But you get, it's obvious that you don't go out and use organic rich soil as a prebiotic uh, substrate. There are things here on the earth environments where they're not obvious. Okay, when did they occur? Clays and dry land. This can be seen in zircon, the oldest zircons we have. There's weathering. Uh, it's uh, still silent about what temperature, whether it was 200 degrees C or climate temperatures, uh, whether this occurred. Okay, go to something extremely rare, sodium uh, silicate uh, rich lava. Extremely sodium rich lava stabilizes ferric iron. It forms uh, uh, ferric iron, sodium silicate, azurine. And uh, people are into mineralogy. Uh, the iron in the magma that was originally ferrous becomes ferric, and, and we end up uh, with very little ferrous iron left in the magma, and the magma becomes extremely uh, reducing. Uh, and these go back probably three billion years. They're extremely rare. It's again an environment. Uh, where sodium silicate is stable, extremely alkaline, it's an environment where ribose will form. Uh, silicate, silicon dioxide in a very alkaline solution, just like boron, uh, will stabilize ribose. Okay, the silicon carbide, again, extremely rare. Uh, don't have a good record for it. But where we do uh, find that these rare minerals are abiotic. So, 
some of your male chromat looks very biological and uh, we uh, don't uh, we find out uh, that it's actually a product of life. Uh, whether it's C4, uh, we see that back as far as we have samples of C4, it's obviously abiotic. If we're worried about a platinum group element, uh, we certainly get these back to where we get serpentine, no older record. Uh, they can form uh, from oxygen reduction, oxidation of sulfides, where they're ultimately biological. Uh, they can form from carbonation. And they, uh, various processes, so sometimes uh, they are, in fact, uh, biological. And if you want to use a platinum catalytic converter to start like uh, uh, using methenium or anything else, it's quite rare. Even though they're rare and you acknowledge they're rare, uh, there's something that probably go on on the list. The serpentine vents that I've gone into are something that would be extremely common. And my natural instinct is to focus on something common rather than rare. Uh, but these catalysts would probably uh, be around in the environment. Okay, we uh, can quickly ask our friendly eyewitness. It's gone through a few generations since then. Uh, these are, are organisms that colonize sheets of olivine. They may be, well be doing a serpentinization uh, reaction. And uh, we can uh, ask him a few questions here. They'll use cobalt and nickel. Uh, they're living at extremely high pH. We don't see evidence of the pH. Uh, there are organisms in this environment that use the uh, hydrogen plus CO2. It's not known whether these organisms have the ability or whether they're eating the olivine directly and making serpentine. Uh, CO2, carbon monoxide use, uh, deep. Again, we don't know whether it was it inherent part of the way the methanogenesis, the cedogenesis is done. Again, to remind you, it's done by photolysis. The Earth will build up a very carbon monoxide rich atmosphere. And as soon as we get methanogens, uh, unless there's something that can eat it. So it will build up, it will be a very good substrate, high evolutionary pressure using essentially this, uh, maybe in perhaps even the same machinery, so it's not known whether the Earth went through that state or not. Okay, the conclusions here first, the vents of serpentine, uh, my process of checking them out has come out that they're uh, very attractive from the view of a geologist. We need to check everything else here. Uh, we go back uh, to the turn of the previous century. Here's Leroy Harvey. And supplying uh, uh, the uh, uh, camp uh, with fish. And he asked the question whether the tall grass uh, prairie on the high plains uh, was man-made or whether it was a natural environment. This is something that ecologists are still debating. Uh, the oak hickory and beech maple uh, uh, forest here uh, you have well, very large oaks here I see on campus, uh, which were probably uh, deliberately maintained at one time. Uh, this, uh, people in Sweden at one stage uh, used swine under oak trees. Did they do? It was done in England, so I presume it was done here, uh, where oak, oak trees would be maintained. Oak trees again were maintained in the day, and the Americans obviously did not have swine. Uh, uh, but they didn't know you could wash water in the acorn, do acorns and grind them, and that they would be in different groups differently. The main problem he had was the Native Americans had just been evicted from the tall grass prairie, uh, so the encroachment of trees and brush under the prairie that would be uh, uh, not approachable was maintained by setting prairie fires uh, was not as evident to him as it would be to somebody now. So he realized the fire and the people played a part, but he was on the side that considers them fairly natural. 
Okay. I'll cut things off here, and I presume we're open to questions. Thank you. I think it's a viable, it's a viable one geologically. It's a much more common environment than appealing to sodium uh, silicate. And if somebody uh, finds either something else that will stabilize it in the environment, we're, uh, we're dealing with boron, which is relatively common element. We're dealing with serpentine that's going to be relatively common. So that there's another way to make it, I'm, I'm perfectly happy. Uh, they did demonstrably make it in the lab. And Lambert's uh, group demonstrably made it with sodium silicate. Uh, you, you take a strong detergent in the wall and have sodium silicate in, uh, which is uh, uh, to take, uh, uh, take the uh, it's make the salt alkaline and it also, I think, serves to take cal excess calcium out of water to help the salt work. But uh, most cases, there's on the earth, uh, there's enough other cations that we always have something like a feldspar, it's a sodium aluminum silicate rather than a pure sodium silicate. But these very sodium rich and Intrude, highly alkaline intrusions do have this uh, process. And they're quite rare. That's something? You talked about photosynthesis. Yes. Uh, did you mean that green photosynthesis producing oxygen or the photosynthesis by, by other bacteria, you know, for instance, the sulfur? Uh, so the early photosynthesis, the first photosynthesis is probably H2 using, which is really photocatalysis. You, this is the foot in the door for photosynthesis because it's photocatalysis. The organism does not have to be good at it because the free energy is running the right way. It just has to be able to outcompete the other organisms. Uh, some of the H2 is not particularly soluble in water, so once it gets in the air, it stays there. If you're in the upper mixed layer of the ocean, you have first grabs of any H2 that comes down. Uh, this gets your foot in the door, but you're very limited uh, on productivity because you have to wait for an abiotic process to make H2. Uh, the iron and sulfur based photosynthesis with plow, the first bacterium that gets that becomes extremely productive by factors of thousands approaching modern global productivity almost immediately. Once it can dispense with having to use any hydrogen, it it's, uh, has a sulfide and ferrous iron that are very abundant in, in water. It quickly uh, turns the ocean into slime where all the wind blows and the descendant of it, it be eventually becomes the cyanobacteria colonized land. So the, and the advantage of oxygen on land is the minute you get weathering, you get granite, you get quartzite, quartz sand, uh, you get very iron poor rocks, uh, sulfur is soluble, so it rains it all and just quickly leach from the environment. You need four ferrous irons to make one organic carbon. So it's not like iron is a nutrient in the southern ocean or something now. It's very dependent on it. The organism that accidentally makes a little bit of oxygen uh, benefits greatly. The variety of it make, makes a little bit more benefits a lot. The organism that can completely dispense with it becomes the ancestor of the cyanobacteria. And somehow an organism with these two photosystems and two organisms combined and both photosystems are related, descend from this original bacteria. 
something over 90% of bacterial clients descend from this original photosynthetic organism in this molecular tree. So, which is no surprise. The minute you get photosynthesis of extremely abundant, you know, most of the biomass, most of the tickets to the evolution are in the lottery, and you cash them in. Excellent. And the middle market diamond, uh, fascination ratio of minus 10, uh, rather than a more characteristic yep. 25. Um, what, is, and, uh, what is the reason for that, and why? Uh, and what is the age? Uh, uh, you, is that you have the, the, one, uh, the one in Kazakh span are associated with the Urals. Uh, the one that's in China are associated with some abduction of material that was formed in one of the snowball earth events in the latest Precambrian. Yeah, that's um, known from oxygen isotopes. Yeah. If you mix something from uh, a metal or a carbonate source with an organic source, it can move you to the middle. You can always move to the metal, like an issue of a green one. Mm -hmm. You can't. Mixing will not move you out. Mm -hmm. So any, anything in the uh, metal, there are various places where you get these carbon rich gneisses that have gone. There, I think uh, Zilva carbon isotopes have been measured on quite a few of them. Now but I don't have uh, the data particularly handy, but having something can does not uh, bother me at all. Carbon uh, moves around, fractionates a little bit, and it moves around a lot. And at these temperatures, uh, the material is going to re So you, you get diamonds with a spread of, uh, of CO, uh, carbon, a much like the, the peridotite diamonds. They're mixed. So you get this bell curve, which reflects um, uh, mixing that. Basically, any, any, any mid ocean ridge basalt, you get a narrow bell curve. If you get a highly alkalic basalt, it can be tapping domains. And kimberlite is even tapping a smaller domain. And you can get, get stuff farther and farther. Yeah, just for anything you want to look at, isotopes, either, either radiogenic ones or uh, that'd be. You don't get a lot of variation of strontium isotopes in water compared, compared to what you get in a lot of the It's very small volumes of the metal. Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing, mixing, uh, which tends to destroy signal, but also impart information at the same time. Excellent. And you also mentioned some uh, subjective material of uh, 4.26 billion years. Old material yes. in, in, in India. Yes. So what exactly was the story? It would be subducted deep into the mantle. Uh -huh. Come around again, there would be a low percentage of melting. It would form something like kimberlite or carbonatite. Uh -huh. Not make it through the continental lithosphere, but freeze deeply. Get remelted later, like when a mantle plume or something showed up, or subduction zones showed up. Uh, get carried to the surface with it. Unity 142 is a short strontium band for 146, which is half life of about 100, 100 million years, 107, I think, about 103. I have it at the top of my head. It doesn't make any difference. So it can only, uh, anomalies of it from the mantle average can only build up on their early earth. Mixing will destroy them, but can never produce them. It can only be produced early. So and whether it's depleted in it or enriched in it doesn't make any difference. That it can all, that we're, it's recording some memory of a process that occurred very early in the earth, and the material has never been chemically mixed like most of the earth has for uh, rare earth elements back. Into a, uh, 
coal and metal as to what the reservoir level. You would see much smaller variations, which eventually just get hard to see. Mark? Yeah, that sort of leads into a question I was thinking about. I mean, that you said that would be a process uh, that's preserved a reservoir, essentially. Yeah. It doesn't have to be subduction. But the question I was thinking was, if you have a HD in the world without subduction, if you don't have something that has the net effect of subduction, you can never get rid of the CO2. Mm -hmm. So you have to have something with a net effect of subduction. Okay. I don't really... It doesn't have to no, be... I like don't have, it doesn't have to be exactly like water. Mm -hmm. uh, the, all those rocks uh, we see look, look like island arcs. Yeah, sure. So we... Uh, by the don't really have the geometry. Mm -hmm. uh, the kind of free tie stuff in Greenland, we have, even though you have a lot of accretive belts, you don't, either it's not seen or it doesn't exist. Uh, you don't see the striped slip like you get in the younger accretionary uh, belt, in, like in Alaska or in the superior province of Canada. There's stripes slip in the terrains in Sweden or not? Or, yeah. Yeah. Uh, 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 if you have small enough plates, you may be able to avoid stripes. We don't know the size of plates. Uh, we don't see good stripes of faults until later. The plates may have been somewhat deformable. You need something uh, and the subduction could be too, even be uh, too sided, even though it seems it seems hard to do that. That, that, that two things could come together. Like the, that it seems that one of them would win out, would win out, and you'd have one side of the subduction. But it just kind of from a feeble under, mechanical understanding of plate tectonics, that we understand it very well geometrically. Uh, but something that you could put into another planet around another star, size, temperature of the interior of the planet, the composition of the planet, how subduction would behave. Yeah, you need, your hypothesis is you need something yeah, to we don't down, down, but you, yeah, you need to get the material down. Yeah. It's easier to get it down with two sided subduction since everything stays cold. There, there's no evidence, I know of ever, ever a two sided. Convection occurring. Uh, the zircons are occurring from granitic magmas under fairly hot crust, but still crust with a kind of hot continental gradient at the upper two, up to three or four kilometers would be, if the surface was cool, it would be cooler uh, than 100 degrees C. There'd still be a habitable subsurface by the time uh, we get. Zircons that somebody can tell us something about the uh, depth and temperature that are forming like 10 kilometers uh, deep at 700 degrees C or something. So it's you know, a kilometer or more. Trying to get the number from Hopkins all up to top of that. Yeah, you, you, you don't have bubbling granite magma everywhere on the surface at the same time. And we still have it otherwise because it yeah. wouldn't stop that. Yeah, it wouldn't stop that. Yeah. yeah. And so there's a sampling bias that will see the zircons from granite, the granitic rocks that stay around, uh, rather than from a plagiogranite that's stuck in a bunch of basalt that's going to either get highly metamorphosed or it's going to get weathered, and it's a very small amount of it. The salts are going to have to be very lucky to get that zero out of the planet. More questions? If not, I'd like to thank Mark once more. Please. For those interested, there are should be refreshments and snacks.